Hello everyone, a very good morning. This is Ramita Bansal, working as an assistant professor in the Department of Bachelors in Computer Application from IMT College of Management. I'm here with the topic Scope of Finance. Whenever we discuss finance, it is actually its management that is being emphasized upon. Finance to a business enterprise is treated in the same way as blood to a human body is. Just like human need blood for the smooth functioning of its body, in the same way, business enterprises need finance for the smooth running of their business activities. Let's come to its introduction part. Most often people get confused whenever we talk about finance. They really mean we are talking about money, but that's not the case. In reality, finance is not money. It is the provision of money. Let's say you are an entrepreneur. You have a great business idea that you would like to implement. So the first thing that you would need is fund. You would start searching for investors who believe in your idea, who would like to provide funds for the transformation of your idea into a business enterprise. So in a way, you are asking investors to provide you funds, to provide you money. So that means whenever we talk finance, it basically means provision of money. You are actually trying to make them believe that your idea is great and you're actually trying to convince them to finance your idea, right? You are asking them to provide you money to finance your idea. So finance is not money. It is basically the provision of money. It is also the process of raising funds or capital for any kind of expenditure. Now, there are two basic objectives of finance when it comes to its management. The first thing that as a finance manager you would need is to determine the financial requirements of your business enterprise in the near future. You have to estimate the exact amount of funds needed by your firm. But during the analysis, during the estimation process, you would also emphasize the fact that while raising the funds, your cost should be minimum. The second point is effective utilization of acquired funds to maximize return. Now, once you have collected the needed money, the next job that you have to do is to make optimum utilization of those acquired funds in a way so as to maximize the return. Let's say, as a finance manager, I have estimated that my business enterprise is going to need rupees 10 lakh for its future ventures. Now, I would start searching for the sources from where I can acquire this amount of rupees 10 lakhs. And my endeavor should be to collect these funds at the minimum possible cost. After that, I would try my best to invest this amount of rupees 10 lakh in a way so that I can earn maximum return on those acquired funds. 
here is a brief example that might show some light on the concept of cost versus return. Let's say Ram needed a capital of rupees 1 lakh. Right. Now, one thing you must be clear about, even if you want to pay one, that also carries some cost. Right. So if Ram needs rupees one lakh, he has to pay some interest on this amount. So he is charged how much interest? Rupees 10 percent. That means if I have to calculate the interest amount, then we can say that he is going to pay rupees 10,000 as interest charges on the borrowed capital of rupees 1 lakh after an year. So just think about this fact that this amount of rupees 10,000 that Ram would be paying after an year would be a cost to him for raising funds of rupees 1 lakh. He's not getting anything for free. For borrowing this amount of rupees 1 lakh, he has to pay rupees 10,000 as its cost, right? So in a way, the cost that Ram has incurred in borrowing this capital turns out to be rupees 10,000. Now, after receiving rupees 1 lakh, what would Ram do? Ram would try to invest this amount of rupees 1 lakh in such a way that he could at least get rupees 10,000 in return so as to balance his cost with his return, right? In reality, Ram would be successful in utilizing this amount of rupees 1 lakh only if he could get a return of an amount which is more than rupees 10,000, which is actually the cost that he is going to pay on the borrowed capital of rupees 1 lakh. So here is a note that rupees 10,000 will act as the cost to run. So his return must exceed or at least equal to rupees 10,000. In reverse, if there may be a case that Ram might fail in seeking good investment opportunity and he could hardly earn a return of rupees 8,000 on the investment. So in that scenario, we could say that the return that Ram has earned on investment of this borrowed capital is less than the cost that Ram is going to pay on this borrowed capital, right? So his return would be less than the cost that he's going to pay. So we can say that Ram has not made good investment decisions. So as a finance manager, he must be very peculiar in deciding the investment opportunities in which he's going to invest his acquired funds. So next is a very important topic that is a key to financial management. There are three types of decisions that each and every finance manager has to make while working in an organization. 
and they can be broadly categorized as investment decision, financing decision, and dividend decision. So here is the classification of each decision. So let's quickly move forward to the next slide. So the first comes financing decision. In this particular decision, finance manager has to make two decisions, two very important decisions. First is he has to decide the capital structure of his enterprise. Capital structure as in the promotion of debt and equity that he is going to have in firm's capital structure. And the second important decision he has to make regarding the cost. Now, I just want to put uh, some light on the sources of finance. See, say you need rupees one lakh, right? The moment you decide that you would need rupees one lakh, the first thing that you would do is you would look for the sources of finance from where you can get that amount of rupees one lakh. So sources of finance can be broadly categorized into long-term sources as well as short-term sources. Long-term sources are those sources from where you can acquire funds for a longer period of time, for more than five years. That's why the capital that we can raise from long-term sources of finance is regarded as permanent capital. Whereas short-term sources are those from where you can acquire funds for a short period of time. Right? Probably within a year, you have to return the principal amount as well as the interest that is being charged on those sources. So here is a slide that basically shows you the contrast and comparison of two major sources of finance, equity and debt. They are the two long-term sources of finance from where a firm can get permanent sort of capital for its business operations. They both have their own pros and cons. In case of equity, you can say that equity shareholders, they are the real owners of the enterprise, right? And uh, in case of debt, a firm issues debentures, right? But whenever a firm issues debt, they have a fixed maturity. In case of equity shares, there is no fixed maturity. And in case of debt, a firm is bound to pay its interest obligations to the investor. But in case of equity, there is no bound binding on the firm, right? As long as the firm earns profit, shareholders will get share of profit in the form of dividends, returns. But there is no binding on the company to pay to their shareholders, right? And there is one major important thing about debt is that the interest that is being charged on the debt amount is tax deductible. And for the same reason, debt is considered as a cheaper source of finance than equity. Right. So here is some contrast of equity versus debt financing. Now we are coming to cost of capital. See, as the name suggests, every source of finance, whether it is debt, whether it is equity, each source of finance is having its own cost, right? So how can we define this term, cost of capital? It is actually the minimum rate of return that investors expect 
from a business enterprise in return for their money. See, the cost of capital is a concept which has two meanings. Let's say here is a company ABC who needs funds of rupees 1 lakh at an interest of rupees 10 percent. I'm taking the same example that I have discussed earlier. So this company has to borrow an amount of rupees 1 lakh at the rate 10 percent per annum. Right. Now see this rupees 10 percent that is approximately or appropriately rupees 10,000 would be treated as a cost which is incurred by company A, B, C. Right. But the same rupees 10,000 is also treated as a return by whom? by the investor or by the lender who has provided rupees 1 lakh to this company ABC. I'm trying to say that this, this amount of rupees 10,000 is acting as a cost to one company and it is acting as a return to the other company. For ABC, who is borrowing capital, 10,000 is a cost. And for this lender, let's say X, Y, Z, who is lending the money of rupees 1 lakh, for him or for it, this amount of rupees 10,000 would be treated as a return. That is why cost of capital is defined as minimum rate of return that an investor expects in return of his landed money, right? So that means this lender XYZ, he is expecting a minimum return of rupees 10,000. Why? because it has landed its capital of rupees 1 lakh to ABC. So cost of capital has a dual aspect. For one company, it may act as a cost and for the other company, it is a return. The next is, Specific cost of capital, as I had already discussed that each and every source of finance has a cost associated with it. Generally, whenever we decide a capital structure of a firm, we are usually concerned with long-term sources of finance, which included debt, equity, preference shares and there is one more that is retained earnings. These are considered as long-term sources of finance and these are those sources from where a business firm can get permanent capital for successful completion of its operations. Now, as I stated earlier, each source of finance has its own cost and they are being denoted as KD, KE, KP and KR. KD is the cost of debt, KE stands for cost of equity, KP stands for cost of preference shares and KR stands for cost of retained earnings. Now, regarding this cost of debt capital, I have told earlier that debt has a special feature. And what is that? The tax that a company has to pay 
on the debt amount is tax deductible. That means if a company has raised a debt amount of, let's say, rupees 1 lakh, right? And the corporate tax debt that it is going to pay is, let's say, 30%. And the interest that a company has to pay on this debt amount is 10%. So that means an interest amount of rupees 10,000 should not be treated as KD. Why? Because the interest on this debt amount, which is rupees 10,000, is tax deductible. Right? So in effect, 10,000 rupees is not cost of debt, or you can say 10% is not cost of debt in real. It should be less. Why? Because the interest that is being charged on debt amount is tax deductible. Right? So if we have to calculate the real cost of debt including the tax benefit, then how can we calculate it? We'll simply use this formula. One thing that you must have to keep in mind that whenever we are talking about cost of capital, it should always be expressed in percentage form, not in rupees form. This is for to make you understand. But whenever we are discussing cost of capital, we would also expressed it in the form of percentage. Now, coming back to the problem. Uh, so the real cost of debt would be 10% into one minus 30%. So 10% would be 0.1, so sorry. 10% would be 0.1, 1 minus 0.3. So 0.1 into 0.7. So this would be 0 0.07. So in amount, if you want to find out, How much it is going to be? Rupees 7,000. So see the difference here. Because of tax benefit, because the interest on debt is tax deductible, the cost of that debt that we are observing or uh, we are speculating to be rupees 10,000 is actually not rupees 10,000. It turns out to be rupees 7,000 because of the tax benefit that debt enjoys. That is why also debt is considered as cheaper source of finance than equity. I hope this is clear to you. Okay. It's coming to the next slide. In the previous slide, we have discussed specific cost of capital. There is another concept which is called weighted average cost of capital, WACC. And this is also called as overall cost of capital. Right. So here what we are going to do is, let's say um, there's a firm whose capital requirement is rupees 5 lakh. Right. Now, the firm has to decide its capital structure. That means he has to. Uh, the firm has to decide what amount it is going to have in the form of debt and what amount it is going to have in the form of equity. So for this particular example, let's say firm has to take two sources of finance. That is one is debt and one is equity, right? And firm has decided that it is taking rupees 3 lakhs 
from debt and the remaining 2 lakh amount as equity, right? So, on debt, the cost of debt is 10% and let's say cost of equity is 15%. Right. See, cost of debt is always less than cost of equity. This is a thing that you must be clear. Right. Reason I have already told. First reason, the interest on debt is tax deductible, which makes its cost less. And the second reason is that uh, the amount that equity shareholders has invested in the company carries more risk. So if there is more risk, there is more expected return also. Right, so that is why I have uh, taken figures as ten percent and fifteen percent because uh, the return that equity shareholders are expecting should be more than what is expected by debenture holders because of the risk, because of more risk involved in equity shares. Right. So now we have taken capital from two long-term sources of finance, debt and equity, and this is the proportion of amount that we are going to take. So now, if the, if the manager wants to determine the overall cost that has incurred on requirement of this amount of rupees five lakh, how he is going to calculate, for that purpose, weighted average cost of capital is here in, in the concept, right? So here is the formula. Mm -hmm. So what we have to do is overall cost of capital, which is also denoted by KO, and it is also known as weighted average cost of capital. How we can find it out? Three lakh is the debt amount on which we are paying 10% but there is also a tax benefit. So we are considering this formula, right? And then there is another two lakh that we are raising in the form of equity on which a firm has to pay 15% in the form of return divided by the total amount that a firm is seeking which is rupees 5 lakhs. So this is the formula for calculating overall cost of capital. Now, here we can see one thing that T should be known. So in the question, I must have given you corporate tax rate, let's say it's 30%. So putting the figures, you will get the overall cost of capital that a firm has incurred in acquiring an amount of rupees five lakh, right? So next coming to capital structure, I have uh, many a times uh, referred to this term, right? Capital structure is just nothing but a combination or a composition of long-term sources of finance, which is preferably equity, debt, preference shares or retained earnings. Uh, why we are taking long-term sources here? Because they act as permanent capital to a firm, right? They are with the firm for more than five years, right? So while deciding capital structure, finance manager has to keep in mind that the overall cost of capital of raising the needed funds should be minimum. And how he can do that? For that purpose, we already have a formula uh, that is WACC, right? So here is a concept called optimal capital structure. So uh, there are various theories of capital structure, right? And uh, all those theories focus on having an optimal capital structure, which is nothing but says what amount of debt should be included in the capital structure of a firm so that its overall cost gets minimum, which will directly leads to the maximum value of a firm because there is an inverse relation between cost of capital and value of a firm. 
So if cost of capital gets minimum, the value of a firm will automatically gets maximized. Right. Now there is one more concept that comes into my mind while discussing optimal capital structure. Basically, there are two types of risk that a firm might undergo while raising debt, while not raising debt, right? So one such kind of risk is financial risk. What is financial risk? Financial risk is something that when you add more debt to your capital structure, other than equity, just because debt is a cheaper source of finance, right? And you go on adding more amount of debt in your capital structure. Now, by doing that, you will you are inviting financial risk, which is, see, when you raise debt, you have an obligation to repay the loan with its interest amount. You are forced to do that. You can't escape that, right? So, as you are using more and more debt in your capital structure, your obligations will rise and there may come a state where your company will be overburdened with the payment of interest amounts and repayment of loan amount that your company might become insolvent. So that risk of reaching the insolvency position is regarded as financial risk, which occurs when a company goes on to add more and more debt in its capital structure because of the assumption that debt is a cheaper source of finance than equity. Now, there is another risk which is called as non-employment of debt capital risk and EDC risk. This is the risk which is associated when you are not using debt in your capital structure. There is no another definition for this particular risk. It's, uh, its name itself indicates non-employment of debt capital. When you are not using debt capital in your structure, you are inviting this particular type of risk. Now, Whenever we are saying optimal capital structure, we have to balance these two types of risk. Let's say I'm drawing here a graph. Here, we are indicating debt amount and here we are taking risk as a parameter, right? So you have, uh, let's see here, if, you are increasing the debt amount in your capital structure. Which risk you are going to invite? Financial risk. So as the debt amount is increasing, which type of risk goes on increasing? Financial risk, right? But if you are not using debt, which risk would you invite? NEDC risk. So for zero amount of debt, which risk would be maximum? NEDC. So it's graph would be like somewhat this. So this is which type of risk? N, E, D, C. Now, this intersection point, what would it say? This intersection point indicates that at this level of debt amount, the firm reaches its optimal capital structure position, where these two types of risk gets balanced. So this is what the theories of capital structure says, right? At this particular amount of debt, the firm will um, incur minimum overall cost of capital, thereby increasing the maximum value for its firm. Next, we are coming to investing decision. See, so far we have discussed financing decision, which is regarding how much finance is needed by a firm from where it could get those amount of funds. And uh, it must try to collect those funds at a minimum possible cost. And after procurement of those funds, a firm must try to invest those funds into good investment opportunities so as to get maximum return, right? Mm -hmm. And so far we have discussed three important concepts. First is the sources of finance. Second one is 
deciding a capital structure. And third one is cost of capital. Now, in investing decision, we are covering the second major objective of finance that we have covered previously, that is effective utilization of procured funds, right? So investing decision is nothing but utilization of funds to secure benefits over a period of time. An example of a long-term capital decision would be uh, when you want to buy a machinery for your company, right? This is important because it affects the long-term earnings of the firm. And uh, whenever we say short-term investment, it must be related to the levels of cash that a company is holding or uh, the level of inventories uh, that a company has, right? So while making investment decision, the finance manager has to consider decisions regarding two aspects, whether to make long-term investment or short-term investment. Next, here comes capital budgeting, a very, very important topic. Capital budgeting basically tells where to invest. Let's say you have three projects available into which you can put your procured funds. You have three proposals here, right? Now you have to decide as a manager, is it worth to put your money, to put your capital into any of these projects, right? Uh, for simple sense, let's take uh, these as machines, ABC machines, right? So capital budgeting is basically a decision, right? It is a decision regarding where to invest, which is the potential investment which can lead maximum returns in future. From this ABC, which is going to be the potential investment opportunity for me as a manager to invest my collected amount of funds, right? So capital budgeting is all about evaluating these projects, evaluating these machines that which of this proves to be the best investment alternative to me. If I should go for A or B or C. So their evaluation process is being covered under the term capital budgeting. Right? Now, capital budgeting involves a very interesting concept of time value of money, which says that a rupee today is worth more than the same rupee that you are going to earn tomorrow, right? Let's say I'll give you an example. You have given rupees one lakh to your friend just because he's your friend, you're not charging anything on your amount and you asked him to simply return this amount after six months, after a year, right? So after a year, your friend comes and uh, give those, one lakh rupees to you and say thank you. And you are happy, why? Because your amount is back, the same amount that you had given him last year, he's returning you the same, right? So you will see it as no profit, no loss game. But capital budgeting says a different thing. It says you had incurred a loss, you had given rupees one lakh to your friend, but the one lakh that you have received now or that you are going to receive in future are not equal. Because money has a time value, right? The rupee that you have today in your pocket is worth more than the same rupee that you are going to earn tomorrow. So capital budgeting incorporates this important concept of time value of money, 
which puts emphasis on the fact that money indeed has a time value. Right. So next here is an example. Construction of a new plant or a big investment in an outside venture are examples of projects that would require capital budgeting before they are approved or rejected. So exactly what it says that whenever you are going to make a fixed capital decision, whenever you are going to make, whenever you are going to buy a machine, or uh, whenever you are going to construct, you are, you are thinking of constructing a new plant, you must first evaluate these proposals in the form of acceptance and rejection, which is done under the technique of capital budgeting, considering the time value of money concept. Next, we are moving to working capital management. As I already discussed that investment decision is related to taking two types of decision, whether to make long-term investment or short-term investment. Whenever we are thinking of making long-term investment, the technique that we must use to evaluate the potentiality of the proposals is capital budgeting. And for the purpose of making short-term decisions, short-term investment decisions, like what should be the level of cash, what should be the level of inventory, right? For such type of decisions, there is a concept that is called working capital management. Now, what is capi working capital? Working capital is simply current assets minus current liabilities. When you will subtract the current liabilities of a firm from its current assets, you are going to get the working capital of a firm. In simple language, working capital is the capital that a firm needs to meet its day-to-day -day business obligations, like a rent of the factory, rent of the building, wages of workers, electricity bill, right? So all these expenses that the firm incurs in its day-to-day -day working are being financed by working capital, right? They are being called working capital and they're being financed by short-term sources of finance, right? So here's an example. There's a hair saloon with assets of one lakh sixty thousand dollars and liabilities of rupees sixty five thousand. Right. So how can you calculate the working capital? You would simply subtract the current liabilities of the firm from its current assets. Uh, let me just. Uh, give you a quick reference to what current assets and liabilities are. Current assets are those assets which can be converted into cash within a year, right? Those assets which you can easily convert into cash within a short span of time, preferably within a year, right? Like your debtors, your inventories, right? And Current liabilities are those liabilities which a firm has to pay within a short period of time, preferably within a year, right? Creditors is an example, right? So working capital is simply current liabilities subtracted from current assets. And working capital is something which measures a company's operational efficiency, which measures, uh, which tells about the company's liquidity position, which tells about the company's short-term financial position. Right. So the last decision that the financial manager has to undertake is dividend decision. See, once your company earns profit, your job is not done here. As a manager, you are going to take one important decision regarding how much percentage of profits 
must be given to the equity shareholders who have risked their money into your company. Right. So whatever profits a company earns, which we mostly or usually indicates with earnings after tax, which is called profit or net profit, whatever you say. So once your company gives profits, the next step that you are going to follow is to decide what amount or what percentage of this profit is to be given to the equity shareholders in the form of dividend and what percentage should be retained in the company which is called as retained earnings as the name suggests retained to keep back in the company right for the purpose of uh, future endeavors your company must be having some future investment opportunities. So uh, irrespective of raising outside funds, which is having uh, an associated cost of capital, managers would decide to keep a share of profit as retained earnings for the purpose of future investments, right? So they may decide on the proportion of amount on the basis of dividend and retained earnings. The decision about how much of the earnings to pay out as dividends versus retaining and reinvesting earnings in the firm. Dividend policy must be chosen with the view so as to maximize the value of firm to its shareholders. See, the amount that a company is keeping back, which is called retained earnings, is the money that belongs to the shareholders. Right. And to maximize the value of firm to those shareholders company might decide to keep uh, some part of earnings as retained because the company is having some potential investment opportunities in near future from where it can earn good returns right for its shareholders so company might decide on the amount of dividend and what portion is to be retained from the profits that the firm has earned after paying out every type of obligation, including tax. So this is dividend decision. So I have basically covered the scope of finance with respect to the three important decisions that a finance manager makes in his journey of working as a financial expert. So I hope this would help you. Thank you so much for watching this. Thank you.